I would like to start off first by asking, what is your name and where and when were you born? Okay, and my name is Ken Von Nguyen and I was born in Hue, Vietnam in uh, 1967. Uh, Could you describe your hometown? No, I can't. I, uh, our family left there, uh, my family left there when I was less than a year old. But Hue is in central Vietnam. And where did your family leave to? Uh, we moved to Da Lạt, uh, Vietnam, and then I think we stayed there for about um, a year or two, and then we moved to Saigon. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your childhood like? It was, um, I think, a normal childhood in Vietnam. Um, um, I was a very I was uh, very young at the time, right? So mainly it consists of going to school, playing, you know, after school, doing homework. Mm -hmm. That sort of stuff is a very normal childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, do you remember what school was like? I remember school as... Um, it's different from here. Uh, we don't have separate desks. We sit in... in long benches, girls sit on one side of the classroom and uh, boys sit on the other side of the classroom and it's, um, you know, very disciplined. You can't talk in class and that sort of stuff, you know. So that's the images that I still remember from back then. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about your parents. What were they like? What, what did they do? My mom went to a school uh, and study for uh, to be a midwife but once she got married she became a housewife she took care of us kids um, my uh, my dad um, was a soldier and then he um, um, was a teacher and he was also a congressman mm -hmm. the congressman was he a could you explain that what did, he, what did he do? Kind of like here, I think. Um, you know, the, uh, a representative. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you don't remember? No, I was so young back You're then. So young. I just remember that he uh, um, was a congressman before before we left for um, from Vietnam to here for you know the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, well, we we were just leaving. We weren't heading anywhere, right? We were. Uh, leaving Vietnam because of the fall of Saigon, mm -hmm. trying to flee the country and, and head, head toward a, a, a country that would accept us. And we ended up in the Singapore uh, refugee camp in Singapore. Um, I remember that the last few days uh, before the fall of Saigon, my father was gone a lot. Um, you don't know where? I think at, you know, the capital or um, whatever. Um, uh, he came home. Uh, sometimes bruised and a little bit bloody, and I think it's because of all the riot or the chaos in the streets. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, riding a motor motorcycle, so I'm sure you know there was some chaos that he ran into and maybe got bloodied from that. Before the fall of Saigon, there was a lot of gunfire mm -hmm. that I can hear in the distance, and that sort of stuff. A lot of fighting that I can hear. And you were at home at the time. Yeah. Yeah, we were all at home. In fact, there were a lot of people in our house because um, Saigon is the last place to fall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the capital. And uh, my um, relatives, my uncle, aunts, and their family live in the surrounding areas, in different areas of Vietnam, uh, of South Vietnam. And they were fleeing the fighting, so they all fled to Saigon, to our house. And so within our small house, there were like... Um, more than 12 adults and I think there's more than 20 kids that range from um, maybe a few months old to 11 years old is the oldest kid. Mm -hmm. So it was really crowded uh, the last few days. Where would people sleep? On the floor. On the floor? Yeah, wow. on the floor. And all the kids would line up and sit on the stairs to eat, you know, because there weren't enough tables and chairs and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as kids, I, I remember us not being so we weren't that scared, right? But the adults were, we could sense the tension. But as kids, we were, you know, 
um, we were aware of the tension, but we weren't, we didn't know enough to be scared. And in, in fact, we kind of enjoyed the fact that our cousins were there because we don't get to see them a lot, mm -hmm. right? It was and like a family reunion. In, in one house, right. yeah. Right. Could you describe the days leading up to the fall of Saigon? Um, I know that there was a lot of tension and my father was gone a lot, like right. I said. Um, and, uh, um, you know, it has to do with his job as a congressman and whatever the, uh, you know, um, that he needed to do. He was gone a lot. My mom was home, was very worried. Um, my relatives start arriving and that was, that caused a lot of excitement in mm -hmm. the house. You know? So did you have any idea that it was going to fall? When it did, you know, I I had I was about eight years old at the time. I didn't have a clear understanding of the fight, the war, or anything like mm -hmm. that, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, all the relatives still, uh, my my relatives, um, we they still stay with us, and um, I think my my father had to go and. Because they, they require that every once the Vicon came in, they require everybody to go in and present themselves, right? So my father went and present himself, and um, they pretty much told him his whole history. Because he, um, he had fled, his family was in the north, and um, he had fled south mm -hmm. and changed his name, and they knew all that stuff about him. And um, um, he came home. And I think um, he talked, he and my and my two, um, my uncle-in-law and my uncle planned, uh, you know, made a plan to escape, to flee Vietnam. And uh, as kids, we were not aware of that. But uh, mm -hmm. just from hearing what my uncle tells me from what happened back then, um, my father know it was not safe for him to, uh, to stay in Vietnam because he had worked for the South Vietnamese government. Um, my uncle-in-law had worked for um, some American uh, company. Um, my uncle was in the military, and uh, so you know they all had um, a background where it wouldn't have been that safe for them to stay. So um, they organized the escape, mm. and we left Vietnam by boat. By boat. And yeah. this was May? It was May, uh, May 13, uh, of about 13 days after the fall wow. of Saigon. Do you remember the escape? I remember vaguely, you know, images and things like that. Um, I know that um, my the adults had dressed in more of a... We were city folks, but mm -hmm. um, um, I remember my, my aunt and, and my... my my mom and other people dressing up in peasant clothes and I think they had um, so that they could travel and and I think the reason they gave was and I don't know if they had to apply for a permit to travel but the reason they gave was that they had fled to Saigon because of the fighting now they're going back home right so um, um, they dress in these like Alpa Ba it's mm -hmm. like more of a peasant mm -hmm. you know Vietnamese traditional outfit um, and I remember um, that we had traveled from Saigon to the seaside and stayed at um, like a small hotel and the parent, the adults would tell us kids to be, you know, quiet and things like that. And I remember being rolled out to the bigger boat, to a bigger wooden fishing boat in these little um, basket that probably had some kind of tar or something uh, on the bottom so it wouldn't um, the water wouldn't seep mm -hmm. in and we'll sit on this little basket and the adults would um, uh, men would be pushing the basket out to the boat uh, kind of like early morning or it was still dark and we were very quiet and they just were in the water pushing us out to, to this boat to, that we got on to leave mm -hmm. yeah wow um, how paranoid were you guys I think the adults were scared us kids, you know, it was more uh, of a, an adventure. You know, we d we we didn't really understand what was going on, and the I think the adults were shielding it from us. You know, they weren't, uh, you know, talking about it. So we just um, 
pick up whatever we hear over here or whatever. Mm. Right. And everyone made it safe? Um, not everybody left. <clears throat> um, my uncle's wife did, decided to stay because um, her mother, her parents were, were not in Vietnam. They couldn't leave with us. So she decided to stay back. My grandma uh, didn't travel, um, was older, and two of, my, two of my aunts and her their family decided to stay back um, So um, with my grandma. So not everybody left, although we, we had the chance to all leave, right? Mm -hmm. but, but they decided to stay. And then, um, uh, you know, things got really bad after the fall of Saigon. And so they eventually left also. But they had a tougher time leaving because, um, you know, um, everybody was leaving. And uh, um, when we left, things were still a little bit chaotic, so it's easier to leave because it, w it was right after the fall. But they left in, um, I think, 78, 79. That's when the, the biggest, you know, flood of refugee mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. Vietnam. So they left during that time. And they, they had a tougher time, but they mm -hmm. left because they just couldn't, you know, make it in Vietnam. It was just too tough. And I don't know what, um, I think that the communication, whatever there was, was limited, right? Because, um, uh, and I, I don't know how my mom communicated with her sisters and all that stuff. Um, but I know that the communication was limited. It's not like today when there's email, there's right. all sorts of stuff, and the, the Vietnam is more open to, you know, outside uh, communication. Mm -hmm. But back then, um, I, I I don't know. Okay. Um, so you so you said you uh, you reached the boat. Um, which which boat was it? Whose boat was it? It, it was a fishing boat that um, my my. Um, father and my uncles had pulled money together to uh, uh, purchase but um, it's not um, they 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 just went and I don't know how they encountered this man who owns the boat who's uh, uh, probably own it for fishing and they um, persuaded him to leave the country that they would you know fund the whole trip and his family to get to go for free, right? Because mm -hmm. um, and they need him to, um, you know, what do you call it? The, um, you know, manage the boat or right, right, pilot the boat, right. whatever. To navigate. Navigate the boat because yeah. he's he knows, right? right? So he gets he gets his whole family get to go. Mm -hmm. um, on the trip, there was my family. There was my uncle. Uh, uh, there was an uncle. Uh, there's two uncles and another aunt's family, and then my some of the uh, friends that we trusted enough to let them in on the plan, and they could leave with us. Mm -hmm. So I think there was about 49 people on this small wow. wooden fishing boat, but it's a lot better than some of the boats that people leave, mm -hmm. you know, after that. Right. Yeah, it was crowded. We were on deck, but it wasn't bad. Do you guys have a lot of food to eat? We had enough ration. Um, I think um, we ran into a storm and we we had pulled into this one country where they told us out again because they wouldn't accept us. So we went to Singapore. Do you remember what country that was? I don't remember, but it's all surrounding that area, right? Mm -hmm. All the refugee camps there. I was so young. I remember that we had um, stopped the boat somewhere at night and we could see the city light from the shore but we couldn't go in because they wouldn't let us go in and I think eventually we had to leave and go to Singapore which wasn't the original destination mm -hmm. that we had in mind um, how long were you how long were you uh, in Singapore maybe a month a month yeah um, we um, in Singapore there was um, a military US military base an old base that they converted into a uh, camp refugee camp uh, so there were a lot of people there, um, and um, I think we started the uh, the application process where we want to go, and uh, my uncles and my father all chose to uh, to apply to go to the U.S., and um, the U.S. accepted 
their the applications because the there were reasons for us, you know, to want to go. My father was a congressman. My uncle had worked for the, an American company. Mm-hmm. You know, my other uncle was in the military. That sort of stuff, I mm-hmm. think, um, helped other people choose to go to France, to other countries that were, at that time, accepting refugee, but we wanted to go to the U.S. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about more about your father because he was a congressman. Could you describe your relationship with your father and a little bit about his background? Well, um... I remember that he was gone a lot for his, uh, I guess, for his job. Um, when I was uh, younger, when we were living in Dalat, uh, he was in um, in the army, so he's gone because of that. Mm-hmm. And then after that, he came back and he became um, a congressman. He was home more. Um, we moved to Saigon so he could, you know, uh, work there. Um, uh, mainly, you know, as kids, my my mom's the one who took care of us. Not not my my father is the one who provide for us, mm-hmm. right? But my mom's the nurturing one. Um, as a um, a kid, I didn't know much about my father's background. But when I um, got older and I um, talked to my mom, my grandma. And I understand him more, and I, I understood what drove him back then. Mm-hmm. And even when we came to the U.S., what drove him? Um, um, and his, when he was a young kid, um, my grandfather was a, 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 in Vietnamese. It's called một người quang. Quang means I think translation to English is probably a Mandarin. Um, and so. Um, my father was uh, a Mandarin, and when the Viet Cong took over the North Vietnam, my grandfather got imprisoned um, for his background. And um, my father, as a very young kid, uh, went from uh, living in a, a comfortable setting into being homeless, right? They confiscated all the lands and the properties, and uh, you know, they gave just a small piece of land and a, a, a hut, a little hut, to my my grandma and you know, uh, and the kids. And um, my father at that time was the second youngest, but my my uh, his older brother died of, of from from being ill. And um, so my father's the one who had to, as a kid, had to travel a long distance on uh, to visit my my grandfather at in prison, bring him food and whatever, right? Um, my grandfather died in prison and um, uh, was buried, but it wasn't a proper burial. It was just, you know, buried somewhere. And they wouldn't tell him my my father where, right? And in Vietnam, it's very important to have the proper burial mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So my father actually had to sneak back at night, one night, and dug up um, the other prisoners, uh, told my father where my grandfather was buried. And my father sneaked back one night and dug up my uh, my grandfather's body to bring home uh, to bury. And um, and he was, I think, at that time, only 12. Um, and then um, the family, after my grandfather was imprisoned, um, uh, was um, very poor and... and um, um, None of the neighbors dare to help them, mm-hmm. you know, being afraid that they would be involved and, you know, be persecuted as well, right? Um, eventually, one of my father's cousin, who used to live with my grandfather when he was going through school, um, helped my father go to Hanoi, I think. And from there, um, they fled to south on foot. Uh, through the neighboring country and um, when they crossed the border to the neighboring country I don't know if it's Laos or whatever they were imprisoned there and then and then they made it south uh, with the help of some nuns and, and priests and they came south when my father was about 15 and my uh, my father and his cousin helped each other uh, you know uh, his cousin was a little bit older 
um, was in college age, I think. So they came south, and uh, his cousin helped him to go to school. You know, and and they had help from um, priests and and you know, um, in Hue, I think they were there, and they got uh, in contact with some priests who who helped them, who uh, got them to. Uh, uh, who helped them to find boarding with other families who would help them. And they stayed there and they went to school. And my father eventually graduated mm -hmm. and then joined the military and then became a congressman. Okay. But um, because of his background, he was very vocally, uh, he was very um, anti-communism and all that stuff. And he was very vocal about it. And I think that's what drove him to become involved in politics. And uh, so he was involved in politics, and when the fall, uh, when Saigon fell, it wasn't safe for him to be in, in Vietnam. So he, you know, we, our family had to flee and come to the U.S. And even here, um, back in the 70s and 80s, there was still a lot of hope that somehow we could take back Vietnam, you know, from the communists. So he, um, uh, was um, um, had a lot of dream about that and um, you know joined some resistance movement and things like that right but um, um, I think um, he he was very involved politically even here in the US and then um, he got ill and then he passed away in, in 1997 yeah but but all his life, what drove him was what I think his what happened when he was a kid, and you know his his passion for Vietnam and believing in mm -hmm. in a, a democracy for Vietnam instead of you know communism. So, so you said you were Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, ha has your family always been Catholic? Or? No, uh, actually, both my father's side and my mom's side were Buddhist, mm -hmm. and I think. Uh, when my father came south and the priests and the nuns helped him and that's when he uh, started you know learning about you know catholicism and and that's when he converted um uh, because his faith was there you know he um he uh, came to believe in it and then when my my mom married him she converted so we we us kids were raised as catholics mm -hmm. um was it dangerous being Catholic in Vietnam at the time? I I don't think it was in 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 our time. Mm -hmm. You know, in the past maybe there were m maybe some danger to being a Catholic, but not not in the time that I was growing up. I don't think mm -hmm. because at back then I think the president was Catholic, um, the prior president to the last president that was you know. Uh, when Vietnam fell. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we talked about how your family was blacklisted. I had, how... My my father's family was. Oh, your father's family. Blacklisted because of their background connection, right? My grandfather was a landowner. Um, he owned land. He was a Mandarin, and you know, back then they, when they took over, they confiscated all the property. They believed that, you know. Under, under communism, they don't believe in having properties, right, mm -hmm. and things like that. So my, my when when they imprisoned my uh, grandfather, he, you know, um, the family was kind of blacklisted. Nobody dare help them, dare become involved. You know, my father couldn't go to get proper education because he was, um, you know, didn't have the proper background, right. Mm -hmm. And that sort of stuff. And then you went to Guam. Mm -hmm. And what happened at Guam? We were in Guam for only about a few days uh -huh. before uh, we went to Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Um, Singapore was kind of fun. <laughs> it was, we, we were kids, right? So everything new was an adventure. Um, we, we um, you know, it was strange to have to stand in line and get food, right? We weren't self-sufficient. We couldn't be, right? We we live in bar barracks. Is that what you call the kind of like a 
army barracks mm-hmm. where we have bunk beds and we put up curtains for some privacy between each family. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a community bath. We didn't have a, a private bath, you know. And it was took some getting used to because we weren't used to that. You know, taking showers with everybody around us standing, yeah. you know, and stuff like that. So, but it was fun for kids because it was beautiful there. Um, I remember kids just roaming the hills. It was very green and, you know, the grass and everything and um, a lot of mango trees. Mm -hmm. And as kids, we would go around with our slippers and throw them in the trees to try to get the mangoes down, you know. And um, they had some classes to teach us English and, um, you know, and things like that. But it was very like living in a community, right. you know, a lot of refugees. Right. So it's kind of fun for the kids. We didn't have to go to school. We run around on the hills and play with each other. Mm-hmm. I'm sure the adults were worried, right? right? But as kids, we we had fun. Yeah, everything was new. Everything was an adventure. And um, at night, we would have sometimes bonfires and sit around the bonfires. And there would be some adult or... or teenager with a guitar and Mm -hmm. you know play guitar and sing and things like that right um um and then when we got accepted to the u.s our family left and it it was kind of hard to say goodbye to people who were still there waiting Mm -hmm. and um people who didn't know what would happen for them you know and i remember leaving and waving goodbye and i remember arriving in Guam and not didn't stay too long i think it's we were just there for them to process some papers, maybe. Um, went to Port Chaffee and stayed there for um, maybe a month or two. I don't know how long. Um, so that they could find us a, somebody, a, a family or, or a church to sponsor us. And the, the sponsor's job is to help us resettle in the U.S., right? Help us to enroll in school, the kids to enroll in school, help the adults find jobs. Um, mm-hmm take classes on English, whatever. So eventually they found us a, a a church that would sponsor us who would help us resettle in the U.S. And so we went to uh, Topeka, Kansas and, and, and stayed there for about um, a year. A year and then we moved to Chicago, Illinois. And the reason why we moved was um, when we left Vietnam, we had, uh, there was two uncles my aunt's family and my family. And when we went to um, Singapore, we all applied to go to the U.S. But each of our files are separate because we're separate families. My uncles went to Chicago. My aunt's family went to Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. And so um, back then there was not a lot of Vietnamese in the U.S. It was very lonely. Um, It was very hard because we didn't know the language. Mm -hmm. So eventually my family chose to move closer to my uncle so we went to Chicago and eventually all of us went to Minneapolis so we all stay there in fact now in Minneapolis I have a lot of uncles and aunts and cousins and nieces and nephew so we all kind of migrated there and settled there and that was like our second home for kids for us kids it wasn't that hard I remember I was supposed to be in third grade but I didn't know any English um, so they put me back in first grade. So I learned how to read and write along with all the first grader. So that wasn't hard. Um, I remember that language wasn't a real problem on the playground because mm-hmm. I, I was strange to the kids, right? Mm-hmm. I was probably the first black hair, mm-hmm. you know, dark skin kid that they met, but they were really curious about me. And, and I don't think kids have any prejudice right they were very welcoming on the playground they wanted to show me the slide the swing and everything I was pulled this way and that way and you know we didn't have a problem with talking because it was all in signs and Mm -hmm. you know just pulling each other Mm -hmm. you know so um, I didn't have a hard time selling in um, being in the US I remember as I grow older I I encounter some prejudices um, you know, people would call me chinks or whatever, you know, and um, had some problem picking up some of the, um, like, adjusting to school in the, in the U.S. a little bit just because of the language barrier and the different ways that they do things, but nothing major, yeah. How was school like? 
school wasn't uh, like high school and uh, wasn't hard. Um, it was relatively easy once mm. I figured out the system and how things work. And um, I I uh, was good at math, science, and my English wasn't bad at that time. Um, my grammar wasn't bad, you know, so I had high scores. Um, the only classes that I had some problem with was um, physical education. I think I got a B in there instead of an A. And um, mainly because I wasn't very active as a kid. And I think part of it was because when we came here, we didn't know English, so we had to apply ourselves. We study a lot, read a lot. Um, I remember as a kid in elementary school, um, going through the dictionary, trying to study maybe 10 words per day or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, trying to pick up my, you know, more English, more vocabulary mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. So I was a very studious kid, uh, st study all the time, you know, trying to get good grades because education, it was very important and it was, my parents emphasized that, um, that was needed to be successful uh, full in the U.S., you mm -hmm. know, so I study a lot. Um, college was um, not hard, but not not easy either. I, I had to apply myself. I had to study, but um, had good grades too. Um, I I chose to uh, ha um, study electrical engineering. Um, my father gave me a choice of. Uh, what what his preference was he wanted me to be a lawyer a doctor or an engineer mm -hmm. and i chose engineering because i law didn't appeal to me and i'm not sure why i didn't chose medical uh the a medical field but i chose engineering and he was happy with it he didn't pressure me to enter the medical profession or anything like that so that that was good how long did it take you before you reach uh or before you got your degree I think about five years because uh, I worked during the summer. I didn't go to summer school mm -hmm. uh, during college. Um, uh, I got a scholarship to go to college from uh, Honeywell, uh, a company. So uh, in the summer, they offered me a, a summer internship. Mm -hmm. So I worked for them and they pay me relatively well so that I have money during my school year as well. And then during the school year, they um, uh, give me money each quarter for my tuition and that sort of stuff. And um, money was a big concern because we had five kids to, to go through college. Um, my, my, my mom didn't work back then because of having five kids. Um, so um, we had to apply for financial aid, that sort of stuff. And luckily, uh, us kids did really uh, re relatively well in school that we could apply for scholarships and things like that mm -hmm. to help us through college. Okay. What, what did your dad do? The church that sponsored him had um, one of the member of the church had a construction company. So my my dad worked as a construction at the, that construction company for a while, and then he became a computer operator. Um, back then, where they had the big tapes and the little punch cards and things mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. and then you know, so little things but very different from what he was doing in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with your family in Vietnam? Yes. Yeah. Um, my mom's side of the family is mostly here. Her, her brothers and sisters, right? All in in Minneapolis. That's our kind of like our home, uh, second home. Um, my father's side of the family is all in Vietnam because when he fled south, they were all stuck in in the north, and so. We never met them at all until, um, as adults, we went back to Vietnam and visit. And that was the first time I met my paternal grandmom and my aunts and uncle on my mom's, on my, my dad's side of the family. But they're all still there. Mm. Yeah. What, what was it like going back to Vietnam in 1993? 1993. It was, I anticipated going. I, I, what happened in my childhood, uh, you know, the, the events leading to the Falls Saigon and the whole journey here, the whole refugee experience uh, was very strong in me. So I strongly identify myself as a 
Vietnamese refugee living in the U.S., you know, even though when you look at it, I've spent more time growing up here than in Vietnam. So in 1993, when I went back there, I had this strong sense of anticipation of going home, of having this sense of belonging that I felt that I lacked, you know. Because here, growing up, I stuck out, right, until there's a lot of refugee here, you stuck out because you have black hair and, you know, brown skin and whatever. So I anticipated just the sense of belonging when I went back. And it was a really strange feeling when the plane landed and they I went down the steps to, and my feet touched the ground the first time. It's just the sense of coming home, right? But then, and then the taxi ride back to my uncle's house in Vietnam, all these sights and sounds came back and it was like something familiar yet far away images that was buried deep in me came back mm -hmm. and and the sights the sound and things were so f familiar and yet so strange you know and then i didn't um i thought i would just blend in and be the same as everybody but it didn't work out that way right uh, it's funny how the natives or the local people look at me and they recognize right away that I'm somebody from abroad and they treat me differently, you know, so that was an adjustment, you know, when I, I went back the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was kind of strange, you know, this sense of belonging and, and yet not belonging that I've becoming, I've become an American more. So you, you feel know? more American now? Um, now my identity of myself is a Vietnamese American. I have a, a, a Vietnamese background, but in all my experience, the, the years of growing up, I'm more American. But with still with this Vietnamese connection, with these Vietnamese values that I is ingrained in me, right? Uh, so I'm both. Do you ever feel mad whenever you think about the past and what happened? No. Not mad. I think um, events in, in history, that's not something that I that can be changed. So not mad, but sometimes wondering what it would have been like if things didn't happen the way it did. If I had grown up in Vietnam or, or if, you know, things were different, you know, wondering mm. what my life would have turned out to be, right? That sense of, you know, what if, kind of, you know. And of course, uh, thinking back on Vietnamese history, uh, I still have a lot of uh, attachment to Vietnam as my um, is something in me, right? So what happened to it? What happened, you know, to Vietnam or in Vietnam? I care about, right? I have that attachment, you know. But what happened in the U.S. I care about too, because mm -hmm. you know this is my home now, mm -hmm. you know. So. How do you think your dad felt coming here and leaving, abandoning his uh, his country? <laughs> having to start a new life I think he have a lot of love for for Vietnam uh, his country um, I think that even when he was here um, that love was still very deep for him and he still like the first uh, few years the first you know decade or whatever after the fall of Saigon he still had hope that somehow we could win back the country, you know, and and things like that. And he's always had that dream that one day Vietnam will become a democracy again, that he could return home, you know. So. Do you have the same hopes? I have the same hope for my my people in Vietnam. Yes, I hope that um, you know one day Vietnam will change and become more free for people. That it would be easier for them, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I do. So what, what are your what are your hopes for the second generation Vietnamese Americans? I hope that they will be successful, um, that they um, integrate well into you know the community here, um, be active in the community, you know, um, do their part to give back to the community what they've received. Mm -hmm. If they have the capability, um, maybe they will one day help Vietnam as well. They don't have to return there, but maybe they could help, you know, uh, Vietnam. 
and um, you know mainly I think I think that um, I'm proud of the second generation here because I see a lot of success for uh, people that they are able to assimilate and integrate into the community and um, make a, a good life for themselves so and you know um, there are a lot of success stories and achievements so you know I'm proud of that are there any other memories you, you want to share anything else um not really <laughs> Just a lot of memories of, you know, things growing up, you know, but pieces, right? Because I was so young back then, and but it's, it's so much a part of me still, you know. Uh, it defines who I am today, mm -hmm. and, you know, I get, I, that's always true about your past. Okay. Well, with that, I want to thank you for allowing me to interview you today and, uh, and for sharing your stories and memories. And uh, I wish you good luck, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>